so welcome to the community call. Um, yeah, today, apart from the regular updates from the teams, uh, we're also going to have uh, Bo um, giving us a presentation about the interoperability hub. Uh, so, so let's try maybe to go through the updates in maybe 25 minutes or something like that. And so that we have uh, enough time for the presentation and discussion. Um, so, Susana, uh, would you like to start uh, from interesting? Yeah. Um, so, I guess the, the probably the main update is that we've been looking into making a IBC AI bot, um, which we will add to our documentation site, uh, hopefully in this month. Uh, I don't know if anyone has ever been on the osmosis stock site but they have an ai bot and we were also inspired by that in celestia um and yeah we've been testing it out and it gives pretty nice responses to kind of basic ibc related questions and also more complicated like debugging questions uh and we just thought that this would be like a nice addition for people to yeah just like help solve some of their no, it's not code rabbit. We're using Kappa, which is just basically trained on uh, the IBC Go code base, the specs repo, the white paper, some other resources. Um, you should be it's, it's like a trailer docs too, maybe? Yeah, it's trained on Hermes docs as well, actually, and the Hermes code base. So, nice. yeah. Um, so, yeah, that will be added to our doc site hopefully next month so by next call call should be there and yeah it would just be great once it is live we'll let everyone know and you know feel free to ask questions try and break it try and get it to say something wrong um but yeah something to look out for and then i just listed uh some of the content that we put out in the past month um so yeah, feel free to give a read um, if anyone's interested. But yeah, so that's the main things. Cool. Thanks. Um, um, then if there's no questions, uh, I will I will um, yeah uh, give an update about IBC Go and specs. Uh, uh, so last week uh, we released the uh, uh, V eight point one with channel reliability and also support for um, another channels uh, in ICA. Uh, so yeah, uh, there's links there for the documentation and a blog post uh, for channel gradability if you want to learn more about it. Um, yeah, so that was um, yeah um, a milestone. Uh, we've been working on channel gradability for a long time, so it was good to finally release it. Uh, then last week, uh, we had um, a focus week uh, in the team, um, yeah, and and yeah, it was quite productive. Uh, um, we we investigated and several features uh, and and yeah, I put here links to some uh, POC PRs that we have for some of them. Um, so so we uh, Kian and Charlie worked on a on a POC. Well, almost yeah, the feature complete uh, already, but. Uh, uh, to support multiple denominations in a single transfer packet, uh, Colin and Damian worked on a, on a, on the O2 client routing refactoring uh, to decouple the routing information from the encoding structure. Serdar uh, worked on allowing uh, module safe queries uh, in ICA. Yeah, and, and this is just uh, some of the things that we worked. Uh, there were other things, but yeah, there are uh, PRs open for this in draft. Uh, if anybody would like to have a look. Uh, and we will continue this work um, in a few iterations from now, uh, because now our next priority after channel credibility is uh, basically uh, work on the role kit integration um, and the POC for uh, uh, integration with Office Stack. And that's what we're gonna be focusing in the next two, three iterations. Um, yeah, and I, I talked a bit about it um, uh, last last week. 
Uh, last, uh, sorry, last call uh, for work integration. Yeah, we're basically gonna try to uh, create um, a, a work uh, roll up roll up client uh, using the Tendermint Light client to wasm contract. Uh, so we're gonna take that contract and and use it as a starting point for the work uh, Light client. Uh, we will have to make some modifications uh, so that the the Light client can call the Celestia DA light client that we're writing in Go. Uh, yeah, that's a bit the, the, the main idea. Uh, the, the, yeah, the bulk of the work for uh, rocket integration. And then also we're working on the POC for the OP stack integration. And yeah, we're going to try to POC um, like an IBC sidecar. That's how we, we call it, uh, like a parallel state machine. Uh, that uh, OP rollups basically can use uh, for yeah their IBC interoperability. Um, yeah, and we will also continue with the auto client refactoring. Uh, that will also continue in the next iterations. But yeah, that's that, that's like the focus right now. Okay, any questions about any of that stuff? Just maybe shout out to the Polymer guys as well, because I think Colin said he was going to reach out to get some additional info from them. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, Colin, I think we one way is gonna organize a call, yeah. With with us, yeah. Cool. Uh, then we can move on um, to the updates from the informal team. Thank you, Adi, for filling up the stuff. Uh, for IBCRS, uh, Adi, do you want to? Oh no, Adi is gone. Okay. Um... Sure. Uh, I can I can uh, focalize <laughs> the update. Uh, basically, we released the uh, O49 and O50. Uh, 49 is a smaller one that has mostly like developer experience, smaller improvements, like stuff around uh, uh, around Protos. Uh, some things that I forget, I think it were um, something with Cosmosm checks being more rigorous, but I don't remember what, what it was exactly. Uh, I think I put the change log there as well. Uh, 50 is a bit more significant. It, it contributes, uh, it includes contributions from um, the Heliax team uh, building Anoma for, uh, they build um, ICS 721 to, to support uh, non-fungible token transfers. And we also included data types for Cosmosm client. Uh, those are probably the single most important things that landed in IBCRS 50, and that would be the update. Cool, nice. So, so then uh, with the V50 release, uh, you support Watson clients, so you can you can deploy a light client in Watson in IBCRS, just uh, the same as we do in IBC Go now, right? Yeah, I don't know if it's fully. Um... If it's fully compatible as you guys also did, because actually Rana was looking into it, uh, she tried to compile uh, a client and run it from uh, from the IBCRS Wasm client, and he encountered some uh, some lockers. So he's talking to the composable team. I think he said uh, mm -hmm. to figure out how uh, uh, what 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 are the mismatches. But generally, yeah, that's the idea, okay. because we want to build a sovereign like client in Rust and deploy it on the on the on the SDK page, basically. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. All right. Um, then for Hermes, uh, Luca. Uh, yeah. So uh, end of last month, uh, end of January, we had a major um, version, so one point eight released. Uh, the notable changes were mostly the uh, the addition of a configuration to filter out packets with the uh, memo and receiver field, which are too big. Uh, we also uh, updated uh, well added a flag to specify how many packets we query at once when clearing packets. There were also some issues related to this. Uh, it is now possible also to configure how often the client is refreshed. It was based on the trusting period before. Now it's configurable. And uh, we also added support for the dyma dynamic gas prices uh, for chains such as Osmosis. Uh, there's also a lot of other changes, like improving some a bit of the telemetry in CLI. Uh, I, I didn't list everything. There's the change log if people are interested. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. 
I, I have a question about um, uh, filtering IC20 messages if the memo of receiver is uh, the too large. Um, it, I, I guess that's a configurable parameter as well in Hermes. You can yeah, specify yeah. the, exactly. the uh, yeah. I think you, you added the, the, the filter in uh, V8, right, on the IBC. Yeah. Yeah, we also have a filter in, uh, or yeah, we do validation that the memo and the receiver address should not be larger than, yeah, uh, so many characters. But yeah. Mm -hmm. I think we base the default values on the ones you use uh, for the validation, but it's still configurable. Okay, cool. All right. Uh, any questions for informal regarding IBCRS or Hermes? Cool. If not, uh, yeah, I see that there's nobody from Strange Love here. If I'm not mistaken, no. So then we will not have an update from them, but we have an update from Penumbra. So Erwan, if you want. Yeah. Awesome. Um, hi, everyone. So um, this is my first time presenting for Penumbra. So happy to be to be here. Um, what I want to share with you is uh, we, we did the, a bunch of things in the last month, but uh, something we're pretty happy about is how our Astria collaboration has gone. So we introduced, so we have this IBC asynchronous uh, enabled like implementation that previously was very kind of like Penumbra specific, but that's, that's gone now. Like it's completely like reusable. So we introduced that small very lightweight interface called the host interface. As you can see, it's like four methods. Let's you specify and inject like everything that like the specific data modeling of, of your chain. And then you can just do like asynchronous queries uh, during execution. Um, that's, I, I find like super neat because it's very, very small, um, but completely unlocked a bunch of things. And um, now that this is done, we're kind of gearing up towards more assurance and production readiness. So we have interchain test running for our ICS20 implementation. And we're currently building, and I wonder if others are interested in collaborating on this, um, an in-memory impo of, of Comet that will let you basically import as a library and do high IBC handshakes with your application and IBCSing, but like could be anything else really. Um, and that's pretty neat because that means you can have various levels of testing in your CI, uh, but you can also do sort of like um, IBC handshakes, for example, as like unit tests. Um, so the footprint of of having those kinds of tests like is very, 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 very uh, tighter than than it used to be. So that's uh, that's us for this month. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Comet mark would yeah comment mark is awesome I I, I uh, we've explored like using comment mark as like a replacement for comet actually for smoke tests um, I don't remember what was the blocker but here like the 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 difference would be like oh like everything is in memory in like on like a single machine and uh, you just import you import like the 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 like I don't know, I don't know if we settled on the name but like Comet stub uh, as like a library and write your logic, import your application as a library, you write your logic, and you can like spin up scenarios like this. Comet mock helps, uh, but I think it's a slightly different use case. Um, for example, mm -hmm. like we use it a lot for, oh, like I want to stress test what happens to the application when I uh, <laughs> when I uh, when I bombard my application with like evidence. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. I see. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, in IBC Go, or maybe uh, maybe Damian can help me here. So, so we, I guess we have something similar in our like unit integration tests, right? That uh, because we also we are also doing like a handshakes, etc. You mean our testing library? Our testing library. The unit testing library. It's um. It's similar. It's pr it's fairly primitive, um, to be honest. But um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know exactly what 
what I should share about it. No, but but it's a similar idea. It's right? basically spinning up like Cosmos SDK applications in process, and we maintain like a kind of a test chain struct, which has a a comment validator set on it, and then we just have like a reference to last committed header and a proposed header. Yeah, and then um, let it go through the ABCI process like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, and and then what you were mentioning about the host interface uh, trade. So so this is basically to let other people use your IBC implementation. Yeah, exactly. So so the first uh, step towards like oh like we want to to publish our IBC work is like first we built it for us. Like we have like this state model where we do every read like asynchronously. We have this read your own. Uh, right cache that like lets you do like very fast writes during application execution. Um, so we have this like cool ABC stuff, but it's very like penumbra specific. So there was a bunch of work to remove all the penumbra specific parts and uh, narrow them down to a small interface that downstream consumers can just inject. And it doesn't leak in every like type signature like you do it once. And then like that's like you can just reuse uh, the whole thing. So that's what the host interface lets you do. It's just like specify, kind of abstracts away like the data modeling of your application. Like where is the chain ID stored? I don't know, don't care. Uh, just call this method and you have access to it and you can do it asynchronously. Okay, cool. So, so then this means that developers have the choice of uh, using IBC RS or using your host interface trait uh, to use your implementation uh, or is that uh, a bit uh... yeah but it's not it's not uh i mean it could be in the future who knows but uh right now it's not uh like uh, something you use with ibc dash rs uh, it's like the host interface is like panel by ibc host interface i want to use the panel by ibc or yeah. ibc async implementation yeah. Um, yeah but it's a small enough you know it's not super opinionated like what application doesn't have a chain ID or a block height? Yeah, yeah. All right, cool. Uh, okay, then I think that's it for the updates. Um, so then, Bo, uh, if you're ready, we can start the presentation. Uh, let me allow share the screen. Bo, yeah, you you can go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to try to share my screen here. Um, do, do you guys see? Yes. If I put it in slideshow mode, do you guys still see? I can see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, OK, cool. Um, <clears throat> this presentation is from a, a talk I gave a la in the last year. Uh, this is going to look familiar to some of the IBC Go team folks. It's, they were there for that presentation. Uh, I just wanted to go over kind of like high level how we're approaching our integration into Ethereum. So before jumping in, I'll talk about the high level idea. So we were previously building a sovereign app chain. And as we're building this, we kind of realized that you know maybe this is not the best path forward when it comes to bringing the IBC standard <laughs> to Ethereum. Internally, we have a protocol called Virtual IBC that helps chains that don't natively implement IBC speak IBC. And Polymer handles IBC execution on their behalf. <clears throat> but as we saw with the Ethereum roadmap uh, becoming like increasingly roll-up centric in terms of their scaling, we realized that like having a sovereign app chain perform the service. Uh, does it really make sense when it comes to the trust model of rollups that live on Ethereum? So our next idea was if we, you know, at some point we expect that perhaps Ethereum will decide to enshrine IBC, but until that point, uh, the idea was the best next thing to do would be to deploy an L2 on Ethereum that can handle um, mm -hmm. essentially producing a, like a lazily, like, computed IBC compatible Merkle commitment 
to all IBC State on behalf of uh, all the various uh, layer twos and Ethereum itself, so that from the outsider's perspective in the IBC network, they can now connect directly to Ethereum uh, one via existing live clients, be it clients that Succinct uh, is working on, maybe in the future, Wormhole will have like a ZK client. Um, but regardless of the client used, they can use this client and then now they have the ability to unwrap an IBC compatible, uh, I would say like Merkle commitment from the Ethereum state in a way that now other IBC enable chains can speak directly to Ethereum and to Ethereum rollups uh, without having to go through some like middle translation layer, uh, be it like an Axlar or, or a wormhole, like worm chain specifically. I'll stop there for any questions before jumping into the, the presentation. Okay, cool. So the way we decided to tackle it from a technical perspective was we did not want to rewrite all of the uh, for choice and, and sorry, all of the reorg handling logic and uh, DA logic and, and other stuff from scratch. Uh, so we were looking around, we settled on leveraging the OP stack. Uh, it proved to be the uh, simplest to, for us to build on and also had some like nice APIs that are compatible or similar to ABCI and, and, we'll, and we'll see in, in later in the, in the presentation. So the first step to doing this was we wanted to create a self a self-contained ABCI application. So all of you guys are familiar with ABCI. I don't won't go into too, much, too many details here, but essentially it's just a consensus um, application interface uh, where you define some state transition function. But the ABCI application alone lacks other functionality that we need. We need an event bus. Uh, we need a local mempool, transaction indexer, um, validator preheaders, persistence and storage, and also Comet BFT compatible RPC endpoints um, for L2 users and clients, uh, especially relayers. We wanted to make this thing uh, Erbis compatible. We didn't want to uh, have to make a, a, a brand new relayer to relay within the IBC ecosystem. And then on the other side, we have the engine API on the Ethereum side. It's what the Ethereum uh, consensus layer uses to communicate with uh, ETH1 or the uh, say like execution engine or OPGeth. Um, like these two are actually two separate nodes. Uh, when you run an Ethereum validator, you run both nodes on the same machine. And one of these nodes communicates with uh, the execution engine or the application layer through, through this API. On In the optimism stack, this is also the same API that's used uh, to separate OPGEF, which is their execution engine, OP no uh, uh, plumbing. And I highlighted a few methods. So one thing to note is that for you is on the execution engine side. It's it's not on the node side, like the, I guess, in the stack and the beacon node side. It happens the expectation is in your ABCI app, you have some sort of mempool. It's actually just posted to uh, Cosmos SDK ABCI app here. And that the engine API, the OP node uh, infrastructure would and batches of transactions executed and also inform um, the application or the execution engine of the changes for choice of the underlying L1. So these two interfaces serve essentially the same purpose to separate execution from consensus. So the idea that we had was, uh, why, why don't we like kind of merge these two interfaces together uh, to create kind of like a, a hybrid, hybrid stack. In a way, it's kind of existing infrastructure uh, on the Cosmos side. Wanted to dig a little bit into uh, the third method that we went on. This up method. So on it, you have a hybrid, or you have uh, eventual finality with uh, a strong liveness guarantees around block production. So the Ethereum chain essentially will always be able to produce blocks but it may not always be able to finalize. 
Um, and what we get is three different types of heads in the L2. So this is very different from existing Cosmos applications today. So existing Cosmos applications today is you just have one state. It's just the finalized state. And you consider the uncommitted state um, being processed. That's, that's all as well. Uh, there's no concept of uh, this like safe and unsafe in addition to, to finalized. So to kind of define these, uh, an unsafe block is the block that's just I help. This means that push anywhere, um, hence, hence unconfirmed on the L. Uh, this is the canonical. The safe head is after it has been passing a block to the L1, P noted for sure all of the blocks from the L1 in the batch are they called um, this, the raw data. In the future, they may use block storage or EIP 4844, or maybe they use off chain uh, DA like on Celestia, I, uh, or, or L. For the open structure line, the one, the canonical. So uh, what chain to follow finds the actual underlying data. If it has both, it can mark as safe. At some point, once the L1 chain has finalized, so now the rewards are um, blocks will like a, a pipeline of, of blocks going from unsafe, safe uh, to finalized. I won't go too much detail into default proofs, um, but the idea here is that you can, uh, it's a little bit different from the single round fraud proofs that the Celestia team has worked in and uh, ABC application with all the relevant code and bootstrap in state, and execute the batch of transactions. Uh, this method and essentially steps through the computation on a per op code basis using a log in based uh, search method to find some faulty opcode um, and, uh, and, and uh, this is called an interactive verification played on chain and MIPS and risk two types of um, instruction set that are supported. MIPS is in, let's say they're, they're using that now and <clears throat> Okay, I can skip this part. This is just marketing. Cool. I'll do yeah. I like the three headed dragon analogy. It's great. <laughs> it kind of yeah rings bells. I read a the OP stack integration. You know, the three three types of um with the nice 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 team. Yeah. Honestly, like only really relevant in Ethereum. I'm, I'm not sure of any other like widely used chain that also has this similar kind of hybrid consensus model. Um, I think most sort of ten like, single slot have pretty times to to technicality. Um, but it, I think it is important to mark all the blocks appropriately uh, because. Um, we're pushing up by white paper soon, explore the different methods of verification of state across rollups, uh, ranging from the native uh, L1, L2 bridge. I'm just using optimistic rollups as an example. A seven day window, round trip would take 14. Uh, if you decide to go faster than that, you can have um, a pre confirmations against the safe block. And you can also have sequencer confirmation. So there's, I'm sure you guys have seen some marketing from Altlayer uh, as well as Near. Uh, I won't go into the details of like why selecting like a, a finality layer that's not Ethereum uh, affects the roles themselves, but just know that like if we, if we need to mark the blocks appropriately to reflect these different levels of security because potentially um, depending on the security parameters you select, they will be affected by uh, reorgs, uh, fraud, um, fraud submitted on chain. Uh, and other things as well. And cool. Uh, Adi, I think you have a question. Uh, you want yeah, I, uh, I'm curious. 
which which execution client are you running actually? Uh, it's a Cosmos SDK ABCI application. So you're That's using it. you're using Comet BFT as a consensus client. You're using oh, the no. engine API. Sorry, we're not currently using Comet. So in in, in the in the current design, uh, Comet has been replaced with uh, OP Node or uh, Optimism's plumbing. We have plans on exploring int reintroducing Comet back into the system, uh, but in but in a mode that is not um, for consensus. Uh, like it would be more of like in the context of can we use Comet as a as a shared sequencer, which I think we uh, we, we we've discussed uh, previously. Okay. Or or sequencer in general, like a decentralized sequencer in general. Okay, then um, then I think I lost it entirely because you presented the ABCI interface and you made the parallel with the Engine API interface. And ABCI sits between the SDK and Comet. Engine yeah. API sits between execution client and consensus client. Uh, but you don't have a consensus client. No, no, we're we're using uh, OP node. So we've translated okay. uh, Engine API calls to ABCI calls. Uh, into the actual application. Um, there are some like additional like OP node specific things, but uh, I would say there's like a, like internally in our code, there's like a, a it, it's acting as like a shim or translation layer between the two. Okay, and the blocks that are sequenced, where do they come from? They come just through OP node, which does some magic yes. behind it? Okay. Yeah, so like the, the way um, OP node works is their sequencer, uh, I guess, triggers blocks block production. Mm -hmm. um, so the flow is uh, the sequencer will say, hey, give me all the latest transactions or just give me a set batch of transactions from your mempool. So and then this is translated into a call into our ABCI app uh, mempool. And then once it, they receive the batch of transactions, the sequencer has the ability to kind of like reorganize them, like like do MEV things. Um, and then it passes a, a call back to the uh, execution engine to say, hey, execute this batch of transactions. Um, and then also the plumbing also handles stuff like let's post the batch data um, of this uh, transactions that I just executed uh, back onto the L1. Uh, if the OP node is configured in a uh, sequencer on mode. So right now mm -hmm. in, um, for OP stack rollups, there's only one deployment of the OP stack rollup that is in sequencer on mode since they use a, a they have a centralized sequencer currently. And every other node is in sequencer off mode. So they just kind of stream blocks um, uh, via P2P and also from uh, reading from the L1 uh, as like a, a verifier uh, network. Okay, and the advantage of that is you don't have to bootstrap your validator set. Is that the yes. main advantage? Okay. Yeah, well, I guess security, you get the trust, like the reason why you build an L2 in my mind is you get a trust minimized bridge, which I think it seems like users seem more comfortable using, um, especially users that are moving size. So maybe there's certain institutions that are maybe not okay using a third party bridge to bridge to an external ecosystem, but they, if they have assets on ETH, may consider bridging into an L2, uh, depending on their security guarantees. Like this is just, I mean, I'm just guessing here, uh, just based on the, the L2, sorry, the TVL of the L2s on Ethereum. Cool. There isn't, I, I haven't found yet, uh, there isn't like an architectural description, or is there? There's only this blog post that uh, has words, but no design, right? Yeah, I mean, the code is open source. Okay. Yeah, I didn't even realize the code was open source. I was looking also for more architecture style, uh, like ADRs or diagrams or uh, or designs. Uh, oh, no, parsing no, no, no. the code, it's like super hard for me because I'm not familiar with the uh, it's good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. I'll, I'll okay. drop it in this channel. So, like, uh, I think awesome. one one way, if, if folks are interested, I think one way has some time scheduled um, with the IBC team. I believe like next week or so to to go over the architecture in more detail. Um, I didn't want to like like walk through a code walker, so I just uh, I just went with like the high level. Um, oh, thanks. I have a question. Uh, the, the, this this the solution that you you are developing, this L two, uh, is it is it gonna be like uh, OP rollup specific, or, or can it also be used to provide uh, IBC interoperability for other types of rollups like Arbitrum or yeah, or rollups built in any other framework? 
this would be OP specific since it uses um, uh, OP stack underneath the hood. Uh, I think I haven't looked at how how I would in, um, how to integrate IBC into Arbitrum, but I, I'm just going to assume that they're they're not one to one. Mm -hmm. What why do you think uh, that would be? I mean, all of the plumbing and, and logic is is a little bit uh, different. So, like, we would have to write additional code. We'd have to explore how we would deploy like a Cosmos SDK app um, onto Arbitrum's stack, and, and like they don't have a lot of documentation, so it's not like so we'd have to kind of like dig into the code and see if we can just like shim do the same shim that we did on the OP stack just within the context of Arbitrum. I'm not saying it's not possible, just like it requires more uh, exploration and like the integration, like the concrete integration will likely look different just because they're, they're just two different frameworks. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cool. Any, any more questions? Bo? If not, uh, yeah. Thank, thanks a lot, uh, Bo, for the, for the presentation. Okay. No worries. Yeah. Th thanks for uh, letting me present and having me on the call. Cool. Uh, do we have any other topics to discuss today or any questions? If not, then uh, yeah, we can. I was like that to wrap. Yeah, time to wrap. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, uh, everyone, for joining. And yeah, thank you. See you in the call. Thank you. That was interesting. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.